Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam from Historic Travels and welcome to another video. Now the following video that you are about to watch is a documentary series that I made where I try to answer two questions about the Titanic. The first question I try to answer is, was the Titanic ever advertised or called unsinkable by the people who owned her and built her? Spoiler alert, no, she was not. Well, technically she wasn't, but I'll get into more of those details as the video progresses. And then the second question I try to answer in this video is, if the ship was never called unsinkable by the people who built her, then why did so many people think the ship was called unsinkable? These are the questions that I'm going to be attempting to answer in today's video. Now, I did already release these videos as two separate individual videos on this channel. What this video is, is just both of those videos edited together into one massive documentary film. So if you see me wearing different clothing and all that throughout the video, then you'll know you transition from part one to part two. Anyway, guys, hey, I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure you leave a like, be sure to subscribe, and don't worry, I'm planning to release the final episode of the Lusitania series sometime late this week. All right, everybody, well, hey, I hope you enjoy. Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam from Historic Travels and welcome to another video. And as always, before we get started today, I'd just like to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subs and to thank everybody who's been leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you all so much. You guys are awesome. And if any of you out there would like to take a couple extra steps to help support the channel a little bit more, there's a merch store and a Patreon for this channel in the links below. Thank you all so much for all your support. All right, guys, so for today's video, we're going to be discussing probably what is one of the oldest Titanic myths to exist. And honestly, this myth is probably the first thing that people learn about when they first discover the story of the RMS Titanic. The myth that we're going to be discussing in today's video is, was the Titanic ever considered to be unsinkable? And if she was, then why did she sink on her maiden voyage? So that's what we're going to be discussing in today's video. And without any further ado, Let's get into it. Well, to put it bluntly, no. The Titanic was never considered to be an unsinkable ship. The whole myth that the Titanic was called an unsinkable ship was something that started up after the Titanic went down. But still, let's take a closer look at this myth, because most myths have some basis of truth to them. So, what is the truth behind the story that the Titanic was considered to be unsinkable? Well, believe it or not, the truth is pretty interesting. Now, officially, the only thing that the White Star Line ever said about the Titanic that could even be remotely connected to the whole claim that they said the Titanic was unsinkable was the fact that they said that the Titanic and all ships that were part of the Olympic class were extremely well-built and very safe vessels. And the reason they made this claim was due to a key safety feature that was implemented on all ships that were part of the Olympic class. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Olympic class was a class of ship that was made up of three vessels, and the Titanic was part of this. You see, the three ships of the Olympic class were the RMS Olympic, you also had, of course, the RMS Titanic, and then last but certainly not least, there was the HMHS Britannic. Now, I'm not going to be going into too much detail about these other ships in this video. However, I did make some documentaries covering the story of these ships. If you would like to watch those documentaries, I will include a link to those videos in the description below. So, ultimately, what was this key safety feature that caused the White Star Line to have so much confidence in the Olympic class of ocean liners? Well, in short, it was one key thing. The watertight bulkheads. Now, for those of you who don't know, a bulkhead is basically a giant wall that is within a ship that is designed to separate a few compartments within a vessel. Now, in the case of a watertight bulkhead, it's, as the name implies, a bulkhead that's watertight. And the purpose of these bulkheads was to keep water that penetrated one compartment on a ship from spreading into another compartment. Now, in the case of Titanic, the Titanic's internal layout was divided up between 16 individual watertight compartments, and these watertight compartments were separated by 15 watertight bulkheads. And with this system in place, this was why the White Star Line was so confident in the safety of the RMS Titanic. They thought that if something drastic happened to the Titanic, like a hull breach, and the sea got into one or two compartments, then with these watertight bulkheads in place, it would stop the water from progressing further into the ship thus keeping the ship from sinking. Now you're probably thinking, wait a minute, if the Titanic's internal layout was divided up between 16 individual watertight compartments, 
then how is it possible that people who were within the Titanic would be able to travel from one compartment to the next? Surely, if all of these compartments were watertight, then they would have to be completely sealed up, right? Well, you see, the people who were inside the Titanic had two ways to travel between each of the Titanic's watertight compartments. Now, the first and probably the most direct way for somebody to travel in between each of the Titanic's individual watertight compartments was to simply pass through one of the Titanic's individual watertight doors. You see, along each of the Titanic's watertight bulkheads were a series of watertight doors that could be opened and closed. And if all of these doors were closed, then that would effectively seal off that watertight compartment from other compartments. So let's say the Titanic is at sea, okay? It hasn't hit anything, everything's fine, and the ship isn't flooding. Well, all of these watertight doors would be open. That way people could easily travel from one watertight compartment to the next. But let's say the Titanic was involved in some kind of a disaster, okay? Let's say the Titanic, oh, I don't know, hit an iceberg or something, and the Titanic breached one of its watertight compartments. Well, all they would have to do is seal off this one compartment with the Titanic's watertight doors, and then this would effectively keep the water in that damaged compartment, thus preventing all the other tight of the Titanic's compartments from flooding. Now, the second and less direct method of crossing in between each of the Titanic's individual watertight bulkheads would to simply be to go up and over them. You see, the Titanic's watertight bulkheads did not stretch up all the way up to the boat deck. They only went as high as E deck. And at the top of the watertight bulkheads, well, they weren't sealed up. So all someone had to do was, if they wanted to travel from one compartment to the next and not go through the watertight doors, would be to simply go up to D deck and then from there, travel back a bit, then go back down into the next compartment. That would be how you would go from one watertight compartment on the Titanic to the next compartment if you did not want to use the watertight doors. Now you're probably thinking, wait a minute, if the Titanic's watertight bulkheads didn't go all the way up to the boat deck, they only went up as high as E deck, and they weren't sealed up at the top, wouldn't all the water have to do if one compartment was breached in flooding is simply fill up that compartment and then it would overflow into the next compartment and cause the ship to sink? Well, under normal circumstances, you are correct. Water would do that. However, if only one watertight compartment was breached on the Titanic, the water wouldn't be able to. And in case you're wondering why, well, it has to do with something I like to call the laws of physics. You see, according to the laws of physics, water will not flood inside of a ship higher up within the ship than where the water currently exists on the ship's outside. So another way to think of it is like this. So let's say you've got the Titanic right here and it breached one watertight compartment right around here, okay? And this one compartment was flooding. The ship is resting pretty level in the water, all right? With that one watertight compartment breached, it wouldn't really drag the bow of the Titanic down too low. So, what would happen is, the water would flood that compartment, reach the point where the Titanic is currently resting in the water, and then the water would stop flooding. Because the water on the inside of the ship matched the water level that is outside the ship. So, with Titanic, and with the way that they had designed these watertight bulkheads, the water simply would not be able to get up high enough inside the Titanic to spill over the tops of the bulkheads if one or two of the Titanic's watertight compartments were breached. This is why they didn't seal up the bulkheads at the top. They didn't think it was necessary because it would take a very, very extreme situation for the Titanic to be in for the Titanic's bow to be able to sink low enough for the water to be able to spill over the tops of the bulkheads and travel further into the ship with the watertight bulkheads shut. So with that information in mind, that brings up another question. How many watertight compartments could be breached on the Titanic before the water would be able to spill over the tops of the bulkheads? Well, the answer to that question is a little bit complicated. The big thing you have to think about whenever you try to figure out how much water a ship like the Titanic would be able to take on before the ship would be in danger of sinking is you have to think about how the loss of buoyancy in whatever compartment was flooding would affect the rest of the buoyancy throughout the ship. Because the only way a ship like the Titanic would be able to remain afloat if the vessel was taking on water is if the dry sections of the ship could resist the loss of buoyancy in the area of the ship that was flooding. So another key thing you have to think about here is that these compartments on the Titanic, well, each compartment had its own variety of items located within it. And the weight of these items within these compartments could also play a factor. 
So let's say you had three watertight compartments breached at the front of the Titanic, and this caused the bow of the Titanic to sink down a bit. Well, you see, there really wasn't anything that heavy located in those first three compartments that would really play a role in causing the Titanic's bow to sink down any lower if the ship lost buoyancy in those sections. Remember, weight is key here. However, that wouldn't be the same for the back of the ship. You see, if the Titanic had three watertight compartments breached right around here, in between the third and fourth funnel and further aft, well, you see, the Titanic could not remain afloat with that much damage right there at the back of the ship. This is because the heaviest objects on the Titanic are located in that area, the ship's engines. So, with three watertight compartments damaged right back here, as the Titanic continued to sink down, and then right as soon as it about got to the point where the ship would stabilize, when you factor in the extra weight of the engines, plus the loss of buoyancy in that area, it would cause the Titanic's stern to sink down so low in the water that the water would reach the top of the watertight bulkheads and spill over, and then the Titanic would sink. So, as you can see, the weight of the objects within the compartments definitely plays a role in trying to figure out how much water a ship like the Titanic could take on before the vessel would end up sinking. So, with all that information in mind, it is now time to answer the ultimate question. How many watertight bulkheads on the Titanic could be breached and the vessel remain afloat? Well, at the very front of the Titanic, the Titanic could handle the loss of her first four watertight compartments and remain afloat. However, that wasn't the same anywhere else on the ship. If the Titanic lost more than two watertight compartments at her midship point or her aft point, then the Titanic would eventually founder. Now, it really didn't bother the White Star Line all that much that the Titanic couldn't handle as much damage done to the back of the ship as it could the front. Because honestly, most of the time when a hull is breached on a ship, it's going to happen at the front of the vessel when that ship eventually hits something. So honestly, they thought it was better to have it be tougher at the front than the back anyway. But even still, with the ship able to withstand two compartments damaged at the back part of the ship, that's pretty impressive for the time period. And honestly, the White Star Line had a ton of confidence in this design. This is one reason why they thought that the Olympic class of ocean liners was so safe. And believe it or not, not long after the Titanic's sister ship Olympic entered service, they got their first real test of the watertight bulkhead system. And believe it or not, it worked better than what they possibly could have imagined. Not long after the Titanic sister ship, the RMS Olympic, entered service, it was involved with a collision with a Royal Navy ship known as the HMS Hawk. As a result of the collision, two of the Olympic's aft watertight compartments were completely flooded, but the crew of the Olympic simply sealed up those watertight compartments on the Olympic, and the Olympic was able to make it back to port. So, as you can see, the White Star Line had a real-world test with these watertight compartments. And due to how well the Olympic handled her back two compartments flooded, well, this only reassured the idea that the Olympic class of ocean liners was an incredibly well-built and incredibly safe series of ocean liners. So, with all of these safety features in mind, this is why the White Star Line had so much confidence in their ships. And to top it all off, they even had a real-world test with these watertight bulkhead systems with the whole Olympic Hawk collision. So, I mean, I don't blame them for having confidence in the Olympic class, wouldn't you? I know I certainly would. And there was one other safety feature that these ships had that I have not yet mentioned in this video. Some of the watertight doors on the Olympic class, now not all of them, but a good number of them, well, they could be closed electrically by simply throwing a switch on the bridge. So, with all of these factors of safety, these vessels were considered incredibly safe. One representative by the White Star Line, or from the White Star Line, I should say, simply said that if a ship is safer, we don't know how to make her. So, what this means is they never claimed that the ship was unsinkable, but they claimed that these ships were as safe as humanly possible. Now, in terms of the whole origin of the this ship is unsinkable myth, what I think happened is, I think it's possible that some low-level White Star Line employees, like maybe a ticket agent or something, maybe told some of the customers, oh yeah, the Titanic, that's that unsinkable ship, it's right over there, isn't she awesome? And then maybe some of the passengers on the Titanic said, oh yeah, this ship's unsinkable. You know, I think it was more spread by word of mouth, not an official claim by the company. And then after the Titanic eventually sank, I think that this myth just took off. And then later on, decades later, the Titanic just continued to carry on this reputation of the unsinkable ship that sank on her maiden voyage. I think this is 
the most plausible explanation as to where the theory came from. But as stated earlier, the White Star Line never claimed that the Titanic was unsinkable. So with all of these safety features in mind, what ultimately went wrong on the night that the Titanic sank? How did one small collision with an iceberg sink the world's biggest and safest vessel? Surely the Titanic, with all these safety features, should have been able to withstand the impact with this iceberg easily. Well, you see, what ended up happening was, the Titanic's collision with the iceberg caused more damage to the Titanic than what you could possibly imagine. Of the Titanic's 16 watertight compartments, when the Titanic hit the iceberg, the first six were opened up to the sea. With that kind of damage, there was nothing the crew of the Titanic could do to save the ship. The Titanic lost so much buoyancy in the bow as a result of this impact that the water was able to easily spill over the tops of the watertight bulkheads and continue to travel aft further and further into the ship until the Titanic would eventually founder at 2.20 a.m. on April the 15th, 1912. Now, today's video is going to be a direct follow-up to the video that I released last week, where we discussed if or if not the White Star Line or the shipbuilders at Holland & Wolf ever claimed that the RMS Titanic was an unsinkable ship. Now, if you have not watched that video yet, I would encourage you to do so before you watch this video, because the events in that video directly tie in to everything we're going to be discussing in today's video. So if you would like to watch that video first, I will include a link to that video in the description below, so feel free to go and check that out. However, to summarize that video, we concluded that no, the White Star Line and the shipbuilders at Holland and Wolf, well, both of these companies never claimed that the Titanic was an unsinkable ship. We also summarized in that video that maybe the whole myth that the Titanic was called an unsinkable ship was spread by word of mouth, and then the myth took off after the Titanic went down. However, after I published that video, I continued to do research on this topic, you know, because it seemed like that way too many people back then thought the Titanic was called the unsinkable ship for this to simply be a spread by word of mouth rumor. And then the more research that I did on this topic, I was like, wow, this myth went way further than what I originally thought. So I'm like, I have to do a follow-up video on this to discuss why so many people back then thought the Titanic was unsinkable. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in today's video. And without any further ado, Let's get into it. The first thing I did when I tried to figure out why so many people back in 1912 may have thought that the RMS Titanic was an unsinkable ship, despite the fact that both the shipyard of Harlan and Wolf and the White Star Line said that they never claimed that the vessel was unsinkable, was to try to trace back the whole unsinkable myth to its point of origin. I thought, okay, even though both of these companies said that they never claimed that these vessels were unsinkable, I thought maybe when they were talking to the general public or members of the press, they may have used the word unsinkable when describing the safety features of these ships, and then maybe the press distorted the truth a little bit and started telling everybody that the vessel was unsinkable. So, with this thought in mind, I began to do some research into the origin of the unsinkable claim. Now, there's a common phrase that people today like to say that people back in 1912 used to describe both the Olympic and the Titanic in terms of how safe they were. They claim that back then, people referred to the Olympic and Titanic as practically unsinkable. Now, in case you don't know what practically unsinkable means, it means that a vessel isn't 100% unsinkable, but it would take something pretty extreme to happen to a ship for it to founder. So I thought the term practically unsinkable seemed like a good place to start in trying to hunt down the origin of the whole unsinkable myth thing. And what I wanted to do first was try to see if there was any official documentation of either the shipbuilders at Holland and Wolf or the White Star Line ever telling anyone that this ship was practically unsinkable or if this was something that started up later or if this was something that was started up by just the press. And to the best of my ability, I could not find any reference point where a representative of Harlan Wolf or the White Star Line ever told the press that this vessel was practically unsinkable. There are references out there where they describe the safety features of the Olympic class ships, but I couldn't find anything that said they said the ship was practically unsinkable. However, despite the fact that I didn't find any official statements from either of these companies where they used the word unsinkable, 
I did find a brochure that came out in 1910 that, believe it or not, does have the word unsinkable in it. Take a look. This image is the brochure that the White Star Line officially released in the year 1910 that was describing two new vessels that the company was currently having built. These two vessels were the Olympic and the Titanic. The brochure also states that, as far as it is possible to do so, these two wonderful vessels are designed to be unsinkable. Now, to the best of my ability, this was the only official reference that I could find where the White Star Line ever used the word unsinkable when describing the Olympic class of ocean liners. Now, I want you to pay close attention to the wording used in that brochure. The brochure stated that, as far as it is possible to do so, these vessels are designed to be unsinkable. So what it's referring to is that with all of the safety features that were going into the Olympic class of ocean liners, was that as far as it is possible to do so, these vessels are designed to be unsinkable. That seems like a good place for the whole practically unsinkable myth to have started if you ask me. This is an official brochure from the White Star Line that uses the word unsinkable in the same terminology that practically unsinkable means. Now, as stated earlier, besides this one brochure, I couldn't find any other official statements by the White Star Line or Harlan and Wolf Shipyard where they said the word practically unsinkable again. However, common sense tells me that since this phrase had already started with this brochure, I'm sure that unofficially people at both the White Star Line and Harlan and Wolf may have said to the general public or members of the press, yeah, because of all the safety features that are going into these ships, these ships are as unsinkable as we can make them. You know, these vessels are as safe as humanly possible it is to make them. And honestly, I think this is where the whole practically unsinkable myth began. Now, with the exception of that brochure, the only other documents that I could find released at the time that referred to the Olympic and Titanic as being practically unsinkable came from press documents, like newspapers and magazines and stuff like that. The next article that I could find that mentions this topic was released on June 1st, 1911. Both the Belfast Morning News and the Irish News newspapers contain reports talking about the launching of the RMS Titanic's Hall, which happened the day before, on May 31st, 1911. These articles describe how the hull of the Titanic was built, and they also talk about the watertight bulkhead system that's going to be used on these ships. As they describe these features of the ship, they use the term practically unsinkable when describing it. So, as you can see, this is another source as to where the practically unsinkable term slowly but surely made its way into the knowledge of the general public. Also in the year 1911, there was a magazine at the time called the Shipbuilders Magazine, and it also went into detail describing how the Olympic and Titanic were being built, and it also described the halls of the ships and the watertight bulkheads and so on and so forth. And this magazine also used the phrase practically unsinkable when describing the safety features of the Olympic class of ocean liners. But what you have to remember is, during this time period, the phrase practically unsinkable was used when describing a good number of ships built during this time period. The Shipbuilders Magazine also used the exact same phrase when they were talking about the construction of the Lusitania and Mauritania some a few years prior to the whole Olympic and Titanic thing. So basically what I'm concluding here is, is that the phrase practically unsinkable was thrown around quite a bit during the time period, not just with the Olympic class. However, it does seem like the phrase practically unsinkable did give the public the wrong idea when they were talking about how safe the Olympic and Titanic were. Now, I also noticed while I was researching the topic for today's video that I could not find any documentation that showed anywhere where the shipyard at Harland and Wolf, the White Star Line, or members of the press referred to the Titanic as completely unsinkable. The only thing I could find was the whole practically unsinkable claim that we've been talking about throughout this entire video. So, with the information we've discussed in this video in mind, I think I'm starting to develop a theory as to why, despite the fact that no one ever called her unsinkable, they just called her practically unsinkable, the general public may have gotten confused by this and started calling the Titanic the unsinkable ship. So ultimately, the reason I think that so many people back in 1912 thought that the RMS Titanic and shoot the entire Olympic class was being referred to as the unsinkable ships was simply due to the fact that they 
misinterpreted what they read in those magazines. Or maybe the person who read those magazines told people wrong, and then the whole story of the unsinkable ships just took on a life of its own. Like, let me just try to paint a picture on what I think probably happened. I'd say a handful of people read these magazines where they talked about these ships and described them as being practically unsinkable. Then I bet those people went and told other people that these ships were referred to as practically unsinkable. But then the people who were told about the ships and didn't read the article, well, I think maybe they forgot the word practically and then started telling other people that these ships were unsinkable. And then over time, the story just kind of took on a life of its own, you know, because when you tell the same story over and over and over again, the story is going to get distorted, you know, as more and more people tell the story. So honestly, that's what I think happened. And I think as more and more time went by, this unsinkable myth just took on a life of its own, despite the fact that no one official ever claimed that the Olympic class ships were unsinkable. Now, despite the fact that neither the White Star Line nor Harland and Wolf ever claimed the Olympic class ships were unsinkable, there were a few people that worked for the White Star Line that had a lot of credibility with the public who did state in their opinion that these ships were unsinkable. One such person was Captain Edward John Smith. While the construction on the Titanic was being finished up, Captain Smith had command of the RMS Olympic, the Titanic sister ship. And while he was in command of the Olympic, the Olympic was involved in an incident with a Royal Navy ship called the HMS Hawk, where the Hawk slammed into the Olympic's hull and breached two of the Olympic's watertight bulkheads. But when this happened, the crew of the Olympic simply shut the Olympic's watertight doors and the Olympic was saved. After this incident occurred, Captain Smith was later asked about it, and he simply stated that he was not concerned about the Olympic, and he believed that the Olympic was completely unsinkable. And since the Olympic was unsinkable, he also believed the Titanic would be as well. He was later asked why, and Captain Smith simply stated because of the watertight bulkheads. He also said that the Olympic could be cut clean in two, and both sides would float indefinitely, and the same was also true for Titanic. Now, it's important to note that Captain Smith made this claim to another crewman, you know. He didn't make this like an official statement where he announced this to the entire world, like the press and the general public. To my knowledge, he never did this. He simply made this converse he made this statement in passing with another crewman he was having a conversation with. But still, it's clear to me that he believed that this ship was unsinkable. And I'm sure after the Titanic went down, the fact that he said this definitely added fuel to the fire that people back in 1912 really thought the Titanic was unsinkable. Another person who worked for the White Star Line who made the claim that he thought the Titanic was unsinkable, even though he had no real reason to make that claim, was the vice president of the White Star Line at the time of the Titanic disaster, Mr. Franklin. Immediately following the Titanic disaster, so just to clarify here, I'm referring to something that happened on the same day that the Titanic went down, just a few hours after the fact, the world was slowly but surely beginning to learn that something serious had happened to the Titanic. Now, it wouldn't be until the next day, April 16, 1912, that the world would finally learn for a fact that the Titanic had went down. But on the 15th, there were all these rumors circulating that something pretty serious had happened to the ship. Some people said that the Titanic sank, other people said that they weren't sure but something serious had happened, some people thought the Titanic was damaged and being towed. I mean, nobody knew what was going on, they just knew that something had happened. Now, with all of this going on, members of the press and the general public asked Mr. Franklin if he knew anything about the Titanic. And, of course, Mr. Franklin did not yet know what had happened to the ship, but he told the press and the general public that he had every confidence in the Titanic, he was sure the ship was okay, the ship was unsinkable. Now, I'm not sure exactly why Mr. Franklin would have told the public this. It's possible that he got caught up in the myth and he believed the ship was unsinkable. This would make sense if he wasn't that familiar with how ships were built and ship design and all that. He may have generally believed this. It's also possible that he may have just said this to calm the public down and calm the press down while he waited for official word as to what happened to Titanic. But whatever his reasons for saying this were, it definitely added fuel to the fire to the whole myth that the White Star Line and Harlan and Wolf and all them claimed the Titanic was unsinkable before the ship went down. However, despite all of these claims that people thought the Titanic was practically unsinkable, completely unsinkable, or whatever, when you really study the story of the Titanic, the one thing that is clear to me is that 
Even though I'm sure some people thought the Titanic was unsinkable, most of the people on board the ship didn't think this. They had been hearing these terms practically unsinkable or unsinkable for so long leading up to the Titanic disaster that this was just simply a phrase to most people used to say that a vessel is just extremely well built and extremely safe. It's not like most people on board the Titanic had this religious faith in the ship and they thought the ship wouldn't sink under any circumstances. So in conclusion, with everything that we've discussed in this video, I honestly believe now that while I do think it's true that some people on board the Titanic definitely believe the ship was 100% unsinkable, we do have their testimony to back up these claims, I also think it's true that the majority of people on board the Titanic didn't believe the ship was 100% unsinkable. They, they just heard these claims that the ship was practically unsinkable or unsinkable, and because they heard this term being tossed around with other ships during this time period, to them, it simply meant that the Titanic was a very well-built and very safe ship. And the ultimate reason why I think this myth took on what it is today, you know, where everybody associates the Titanic with the, oh yeah, that was the unsinkable ship that sank on its first time out, you know? I think the myth took off because ultimately the Titanic went down on its maiden voyage. You know, it was the biggest ship in the world. The myth claims that they said the ship was unsinkable or practically unsinkable, and then its first time out, it went down. I mean, honestly, when you explain it to me like that, I can understand why the myth took off like it did. And then immediately following the Titanic disaster, you know, you had the inquiries, you had people looking into the statements made by the press, the White Star Line, members of the Titanic's crew, you know, the Vice President of Line, you know, they began looking for every single reference to where somebody used the word unsinkable and then related it to the Titanic. And, you know, and the myth just took off. That's ultimately what happened. So anyway, guys, hey, I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure you leave it a like. Be sure to subscribe. This video was a ton of work, but it was a lot of fun researching this. It's very cool to now know the origin of the whole unsinkable myth, you know, and what's true and what's not about it. Anyway, guys, thank you all so much for watching. Be sure you leave a like, be sure to subscribe, and don't worry, the next episode on this channel is going to finish up the Lusitania Timeline series. You all stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good day, everybody. Special thanks to my captain-level Patreon supporters, Jeffrey Clayton, Dakota Charbonneau, Moosh, and Greg Gallick. Thank you all so much for all the support.